Okay, well, welcome to this episode of the Sailing Science Center podcast. Our guest today is the renowned fluid dynamicist, Joop Sloof. Before his retirement, Joop worked at the National Aerospace Laboratory and was a part-time professor at Delft University of Technology in the Netherlands. Joop has been instrumental in development at the highest levels of sailing, including the America's Cup and the Volvo Ocean Race, has been with it long enough to provide valuable historical perspective <laughs> um, and hopefully some insights into where we might be going in the future as far as hydro and aerodynamics in the realm of sailing. So you, know, you were involved in the earliest days of computational fluid dynamics and in one of my first jobs out of school, uh, this was in 1981, I helped to develop multi-body computational models of ship and barge motions in 12 degrees of freedom. Uh, we used a theory called potential flow at that time using a, a big supercomputer that today we would have more power on our, our cell phone. I'm curious if you can give us some perspectives from your involvement in fluid dynamics and probably some of the earlier years of, the, of computational fluid dynamics, what it was like as that was developing in, let's say, the 1970s and 1980s. Well, that, uh, my experience is, is, is fairly similar to what you just uh, mentioned, I think. Uh, I got involved also after starting as an experimentalist in, uh, or an applied aerodynamicist at the uh, NLR. I, I started with uh, some potential flow methods, the, uh, which, which were called panel methods at the time. I don't know whether you, uh, mm -hmm. you know the name also, whether you remember that. that uh, we, and we had... Uh, uh, a three-dimensional model developed that uh, um, that worked pretty pretty good for the for the circumstances. With, with uh, as you said, uh, very limited computer power. We had to to run cases uh, overnight, which ran for many hours, and uh, which you can never do in a split second <laughs> on your cell phone, as you had just uh, mentioned. But those were uh, pioneering uh, times, and uh, it was those uh, uh, computer programs that uh, enabled me to uh, do something on the uh, the wing keel for uh, Australia Two at the time. That was in 1981, I think, uh, that we uh, got involved uh, with that uh, development. Yeah, I want to come back to the Australia 2 development because that's very interesting and that was very groundbreaking. But let's go back and, and talk a little bit more about these computational models. Uh, you described it as panel methods. And I, I don't remember if we used that term. Uh, we likened it to finite element analyses in, uh, you know, structural analysis. But uh, for people who are unfamiliar with this, which is most of the world, uh, we would do our analysis in one of two domains. It could either be in time domain or frequency domain. And using these these panel models, we were using uh, frequency domain models. So we were interested in uh, the oscillatory motions of vessels in particular. And as, as opposed to... Uh, say, just the, the forward motion and the, the resistance calculations type of things. So I wonder if you could uh, take a best shot at describing in layman's terms sort of the differences between analyses in, in a time domain and analyses in a frequency domain and how those uh, are used differently by somebody who's studying fluid dynamics. Oh, uh, well, let me try. We, we were doing, at the time, that was just steady flow. So no dependence or frequency or frequency zero, if you, if you wish. And uh, nothing like uh, time dependence uh, at the time. That, that came later. So it was purely a steady flow, which was mainly uh, uh, 
and the, the main goal was to obtain a good picture of the flow around uh, fairly complicated uh, configurations, wings and bodies with engine nacelles and uh, 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 stores under the wings of fighter aircraft and that, and that sort of thing. And get an uh, impression of the, not of the, of the friction drag because friction was not involved in that simple potential flow model, but on beach you could get a, a picture of the induced drag that is the lift dependent drag or reset if you did if you, if you prefer that uh, that word so that was more or less a situation in which we operated at the time yeah that's very interesting it's very different uh types of goals and types of models and i'll just throw out what we were doing i was working in the in the marine industry and what we were interested in was the motions, uh, in particular, of drill ships and barges. And you know, for the drill ships, they would be in a sea state that at some point you had to stop drilling because, well, the, the waves were too big. And we had to figure out, well, at what sea state would we have to stop drilling and what would the operability be of this vessel in a particular environment? Um, so it's very different, and and it was all with a zero forward speed assumption that the the ship was anchored, right? And then with the barges, we just neglected that there was any forward speed. What we were concerned about these were what we call jacket toes, and the jacket it's a offshore the structure that holds an offshore platform, and the largest loads they would ever see in their lifetime was being towed from the yard where they were built to where they were launched and the accelerations from the waves. So it was really very different kinds of problems, which was interesting. And we always thought that the, the ultimate solution was a time domain solution, but we didn't have the computing power for it. Um, so <laughs> it's interesting to see how, how different these kind of problems are within the same, same field. Um, so let's, let's move on from that, I think, and talk about Australia too. And I remember that very well um, because of what happened after it. There was quite an uproar that the U.S. had lost the America's Cup. And it seems that you might have played a part in that. <laughs> and that this, this idea of the wing keel on Australia too was, you know, it was very inspirational at the time and it was very considered very non-obvious maybe it, it's good to start with a little bit of history for our our younger listeners here with australia too which was in 1983 and was the first uh team or boat to win the america's cup back from uh the united states so this was really a big deal and our guest today, uh, Yop Slof, was, I think, played a key role in the success of Australia. And the, the big thing about that boat was that it had a winged keel. And Yop, maybe you can describe a little bit about the evolution of that winged keel, which today seems so obvious to us, but in 1981 or 1983 was, you know, far from being obvious. And why, why wasn't it obvious then? And what was the, the leap in understanding that, that made that occur? Well, when, when I got involved with, uh, with the Australia 2 uh, development uh, effort, which was uh, mainly done here, uh, at the uh, Maritime Institute here in uh, in the Netherlands, well, we had uh, a, a year earlier we had been studying uh, winglets for aircraft, you know, at the tip of the of most uh, civilian uh, aircraft nowadays. You have these winglets uh, that they were invented in the uh, around the earlier mid seventies. And uh, we in the late seventies, we had some we did some research on them. So I mean, you got a pretty good picture of what what they could could do and what they could bring for a direct reduction on aircraft wings. And when we got involved 
or even before we got involved with uh, Australia 2, I, I had realized that the same mechanisms would work underwater on the, on the, on the keel of a, of a sailing boat. And uh, well, I, I simply got the opportunity to, uh, to research that in further detail and, 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 and prove that that was correct with the uh, Australia 2 uh, development. Yeah, and it was it it proved itself correct on the race course. What what specifically was the effect that that they got from having those uh, those winglets on the plane or on having the winged keel on the America's Cup yacht? Well, the uh, the main thing that with the span of the, of the wings as they selected them at the time there was about a 30% reduction of induced resistance of the, uh, of the keel of the drag due to lift, if, uh, if you wish, of the, uh, of the underwater uh, configuration. Um, that uh, meant uh, about one minute in the average, potentially at least, uh, a reduction of, uh, of, of, of of time needed for for each upwind leg, which was a, a, a huge amount compared with the, the differences that were usually uh, 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 there when uh, between the winner and the loser in the America's Cup uh, twelve meter uh, yacht uh, races. Yeah, that's that really is a huge difference. Um, you know, when you look at a minute, if uh, even just on one leg, if a boat's crossing a finish line a minute ahead of another boat, uh, everybody's sitting there waiting for the second place boat to come in, right? <laughs> yeah. Or as they told the queen, there is no second place. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> you either win or you didn't. Um, so today, uh, these... Uh, the, the America's Cup yachts are quite different and everything is about foiling. And even just in a lot of recreational areas, foiling is the big thing on the water. And it seems, you know, from my perspective that a lot of this comes from the intersection of material science and fluid dynamics insofar as a hundred years ago, you know, you might have had a vision for a foiling sailboat, but you couldn't make it because you couldn't build the structures you needed out of wood and nails. You needed, you know, you needed composites or something like this. Can you maybe shed some uh, of your views on that and how material sciences have played into our ability to do things that are more effective hydrodynamically or aerodynamically? Well, that's difficult to say. There are many aspects, of course, in the, in the construction. One of the main things is, I think, the uh, is, is the the, uh, the uh, carbon fiber uh, invention and what that what possibilities that opens uh, for uh, for for constructions of uh, the hull as well as 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 mast and and, and sails. Uh, of course, I think that has been the most important uh, uh, scope widening uh, invention in, in terms of uh, construction and the materials. Yeah, I would say, um, and I guess that weight would be a factor as well, um, that it's easier to make something fly if it's lighter. Well, that's a point, that's the main point, of course, for. Uh, the carbon fiber constructions, they, uh, for the same strength and stiffness, that they, they are an uh, enormous amount uh, of, of uh, uh, less weight than uh, uh, aluminum or, 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 or steel or, or, what, or, or, or uh, fiberglass uh, constructions, uh, as another example. Yeah. Now, you've also helped with. Uh, campaigns in the 
Volvo Ocean Race and the campaigns or campaign that you were involved with were those, I know that the newer boats now are, are foiling even offshore, were the boats that you were involved with foiling? No, no, they were, they were certainly not for them. They were, they were um, uh, classical, but very fast uh, uh, um, monoils. So somewhat similar to the um, IMOCA class that we have nowadays in the, in the ocean race uh, scene. But uh, I mean, of, of course, uh, of a generation that uh, of, of 20 years ago, uh, almost 30 years ago at least, but they were still very good boats. And uh, they, uh, the, 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 the class of boats that I was involved in was the first to have these uh, uh, swinging keels, uh, uh, canting keels uh, in their, uh, in, in, in their uh, configuration. That was a new thing. And I helped them in uh, trying to uh, prevent all sorts of unsteady uh, 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 fluid dynamic, hydrodynamic uh, phenomena that might uh, lead to disasters in the, in, in, in the, in the construction through vibrations and that sort of thing. Very interesting. Yeah, this, th these now where you've got a Canton keel with a, I guess these are uh, hydraulic rams and very large, robust structures for, for lifting these keels. And again, this is, seems like something where material science would come into play. You'd have to have a very strong material to uh, support the, the bending moments of the, the ballast at the end of that keel. You know, one of the risks that uh, uh, nobody was aware of at, at the, in the beginning at the time was uh, that uh, these things could start vibrating under the uh, uh, influence of waves, for example, but, uh, the, but also they could start uh, fluttering in principle, in the same way as in the early days of aviation, aircraft wings uh, could start fluttering and, and uh, with dramatic uh, uh, results, ending in a complete uh, breakdown catastrophe. And uh, another possibility is, is that if it's not, if it does not lead to a, a catastrophe, catastrophe, then it could be a, uh, lead to a situation where because of very long exposure to uh, vibrations, uh, the material could uh, uh, get uh, fatigue problems and, and, and break down because of the, uh, of the fatigue problems that that would not be a, an, an immediate disaster, but it, it would still be uh, quite a problem. And several of the uh, 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 boats at the Volvo, in the Volvo Ocean Race at that particular in that particular year suffered from that kind of uh, of problems, and one even lost its keel completely. And was this uh, determined to be from fatigue as opposed to uh, impact or, uh, you know, sudden wave loads or something like this? Uh, I think the one that lost its skill was due to fatigue. Um, that, but other, uh, not in the Volvo race, but in, in, in other situations, there have been canyon kills that, from what I've read, they were suddenly lost in, uh, in, in situations where fatigue could not have played an enormous role yet. And uh, so that must have been a flutter-like simulation. And uh, they were not aware, the designers at the time were not aware of, of, of that phenomenon. Nowadays they are, but, but uh, at, in the, uh, let's say around uh, the turn of the century, 
the uh, the yacht designers were not aware of the risks of that sort of thing. Now, as you know, uh, engineering student of the 1970s and 80s, I think we all saw the the movie of the Tacoma Narrows Bridge and exactly. and yeah. how it self destructed when the wind speed reached a, a certain point. And the, the bridge started to oscillate. And this was, you know, then due to due to vortex shedding off of off of the structure. And I think those of us who've sailed uh, very much have probably all experienced uh, being on a boat where at a certain speed, either the keel or usually the rudder starts to hum or vibrate. I know on on my family's Hobie cat when I was a kid, when you got up to a certain speed, the, the rudders would vibrate. Is this the same phenomenon that was happening on the Volvo boats? That is, in some cases, that was the situation. Uh, but it, the, the, the nature was a little bit different in the sense that this sort of thing on, on wing-like and key-like uh, uh, configurations, that can happen if the, uh, the frequency of the bending mode and the frequency of the torsion mode are close. And if these are almost the same, then you can get an interaction between the bending and the, uh, and the, and the torsional uh, uh, vibrations. And the whole thing can explode then in a, in a second, so, so to speak, be above a certain uh, uh, boat speed. And I think that may have happened uh, in perhaps one or two cases, not in the Volvo Ocean Race, but, but in other uh, uh, races uh, involving IMOCA type uh, uh, yachts. And uh, I have realized that you can get, you can prevent this by moving the 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 weight of the belt forward uh, like uh, in an aircraft wing the uh, the engines are, are hanging in front of the wing for particular that reason it uh, it reduces the uh, the risk of uh, interaction between the uh, torsion mode and the, and the bending mode in the way that the whole thing can uh, explode uh, dramatically and uh, this is what uh, was done on the uh, ABN AMRO uh, 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 Volvo boat that eventually uh, won uh, the race uh, at the time. And I was instrumental in, in suggesting to move the, the bulb forward to reduce that, uh, that risk. And I think it was the only boat that uh, didn't have any problem at all with the uh, with the with the canting keel and its uh, support at the time. Well, you know what strikes me now is you've just in while we've been talking, given two examples of how your background in aerospace has transferred over to sailing in ways that I would never would have expected. Um, you know, just now with moving the weight on the the bulb forward, but earlier in talking about how the winglets on airplanes preceded by about 10 years, the winged keels on sailboats. And so it's interesting that I, I was completely unaware personally uh, that these kind of developments were coming from the aerospace field. So it's, that's kind of an exciting thing to, to learn. Um, are you still involved in any kind of uh, design work on on modern sailing craft, or are you completely retired from that now, or keeping keeping tabs on what's going on? Oh, I, I keep an eye on what's going on. I'm not directly involved anymore with, uh, with, 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 with important developments with that radio. Once in a while, uh, I help a friend, suggest a friend that he should change something on the, on his keel, on his rudder, or something like that. But that's not really uh, serious. Uh, to come back to uh, your uh, remark that you were not aware 
that uh, many of the uh, things that are nowadays uh, fashionable in, in Syria to come from the uh, aerospace scene. Uh, I think the reason that I was a yachtsman, that I had a sailing boat since uh, 1976 or something like that, I was an aerodynamicist at the same time, you know, you, you, you can't prevent yourself from, from connecting the two and exchanging uh, uh, IDs from one field to the other. And that, that is, I think, the, uh, 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 an, an, uh, an opportunity that, that was, was there for me <laughs> to exploit. And uh, your salience also uh, 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 were happy to do something uh, with that. Yeah, we're speaking with Joop Sloof. He's an aerodynamicist and hydrodynamicist, or just more broadly, fluid dynamicist, and the author of a book called The Science Behind Sailing. And his book has been described on Amazon as the, uh, the New Testament of Fluid Dynamics. And um, I think that's a, a great moniker. And maybe, uh, Yop, if you could say a little bit about what is different in your text from maybe some of the, the classic texts on, uh, on hydrodynamics and aerodynamics for sailing from authors like C.A. Markai. What, what has changed? Uh, in our understanding of fluid dynamics over, and let's say, the last 40 years? Um, well, the Marchai book, I, 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 I know that quite well, of course, is uh, it's not, in my perception, an easy reading book. Perhaps mine isn't either. <laughs> I don't know. That's not, that's not up to me to, uh, to, to command on. but. Uh, what I've tried to do and, uh, be, uh, is to make a link between, let's say, the, the fairly deep science and, for, and what it means for, 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 for somebody on the sailing boat. I, I, I hope I, I've been able to do that because I, I, I have been and I'm still doing both. I mean, I'm both a, a, a sailor yachtsman and uh, and then uh, and a fluid dynamicist, and uh, I, I've tried to explain the why you have to do certain things for the on the sailboat, and not just only the what you have to do, but I, I'm, I've tried to explain why you have to do certain things to uh, to. Uh, to, to get better boat speed or, or, or a, a sail at a, a smaller repair or wind angle or, or whatever. And that, there are not many books, I think, that, that, that try to make that, that link. It's either usually uh, scientific or there are, are, are fairly simple books on what you have to do on a, on a boat. To, 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 to get her moving and without explanations why you have to do certain things. And it's that bridge that I have tried to, uh, to build with, with my book. And as I said, I'm not the one to judge whether I succeeded in that or not, but uh, I hope some people can do something useful with it. Yeah, I love that you take that approach. And, you know, as I look at your book, I see things like uh, descriptions of uh, twist in the sail and, the, you know, the need and ramifications for, for twist and, and why that's necessary. And it seems that if we, if we do understand the why, it gives us a, a place to have uh, what I'll call intuitive leaps of understanding that we wouldn't have if all we were given was the the what or the how. Um, the, the, you know, as somebody who's taught sailing, I will sometimes have students who really get into, I want to understand all of the science behind it. And I say, that's great to understand it, 
you know, but there's uh, a lot of birds that are flying around and can use these principles quite well, and they've never even heard of Bernoulli's theory. Um, so there is, you know, but but they don't have the opportunity. Those birds don't have the opportunity to make these intuitive leaps that could take them to another level, you know, in a in a nonlinear fashion. Um, so I think it's great that you know you're including that in your book in a way that might allow people to have a better understanding of of what they're doing and and why they're doing it. Yeah, I hope so. And are you? Uh, do you still sail now, or do you get out regularly? Do you do you own a boat? I I still own a boat. If, if you you can see my boat, it's it's in one of the pages in the uh, the introduction or something or in the uh, uh, description of the author. Uh, I don't know where you have it on hand over there, the book, but in the uh, uh, Trying to have a look here. It's not the one it's, on the, the, the cover. About the author in that section, yeah, on, in the in the front part of the book. It's, okay. It's, oh, it's uh, it's got a twin keel. It looks like. Yeah, it's 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 a mounted wing keel. I can with very shallow, very shallow drop wing keel. I can dry out on it upright. You know, if I if I want to. Okay. Now, did you uh, did you design or build this boat? Uh, I uh, I did not design the boat. It, it was a standard boat, but uh, I made a deal with the builder that I would uh, buy it only if uh, I could have my own keel and rudder. Okay. Under it, and uh, so he uh, and he accepted that and. Uh, he told me later that he sold about 100 or 150 of those keel configurations later to other uh, other clients. So, so uh, it was uh, it's a reasonably successful boat. I, I still own it. I just, I've still been sailing with it in the over the past summer. Uh, I usually sail around the Frisian Isles, you know, and then. Right in the north of this of, of the Netherlands in the North uh, Sea, and then that's an area particularly between the Frisian Islands and the mainland. It's uh, shallow uh, tidal water, so it's it's very handy to have a uh, shallow draft keel and be able to uh, dry out upright in that uh, in that area. Yeah, that's um, you know one of the things about boats is that you, you find boats that will be designed for their geographic region. Um, and you'll see I, the example that comes to my mind is uh, Jim Taylor, who's a designer you might be familiar with. And he's a, he's a East Coast designer and his boats tend to be very well suited for, for light air um, mm -hmm. that they have on the East Coast. But when we bring them out here to the west coast they're a little bit tender um you know and sometimes the west coast versions of his boat will have a, a deeper keel to to account for that and it's you know it's a very regional effect um that i think is you know it's interesting that you see in in boats that you might take a boat that works really well in the netherlands and it might not work too well in san francisco bay um you know for the different conditions so, um, sorry, but that might well be the case. I mean, you have to design a boat depending on uh, what, uh, what the weather conditions you uh, want to use it in. So, yeah, and and the tidal conditions, right? And the tidal conditions, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so, from that, because for people who did, you know <laughs> aren't looking at the book, which is for pretty much everybody who's listening, uh, you know, the picture is of his boat. It's basically it's it's standing upright. Uh, there's no water. It's the the tide's gone out, and it's it's on a what looks like a mud flat. Um, yeah, right. That's what it is. Yeah, and uh, so it's it's good to have a boat that will do that rather than just lean over and then flood when the tide comes back in. Yeah. So um, I'm curious. 
I don't think we've solved all the problems in fluid dynamics. What are the what are the big areas? What are the gaps right now in our understanding of fluid dynamics? Do we even do we even know what we're chasing right now in that in that arena? Are we just trying to get better computer models or are there fundamental areas that we don't understand? Are there things about cavitation or um, nonlinear waves or things that are still trying to be understood? Well, it, uh, one of the things, of course, that remains almost the not untouchable, but not fully touchable at least, is our first, uh, the, the turbulent uh, phenomena. But, uh, they're very, very difficult to model. So that is still one of the reasons, the reasons where, uh, where a lot of research is, uh, is going on. Uh, I'm not sure about uh, uh, cavitation and, and, and ventilation and that sort of thing. It's not my original <laughs> uh, area of, uh, of knowledge. Uh, of course, coming from uh, from the air rather than from uh, from the water uh, originally, but there, there might still be uh, there may still be uh, uh, things to uh, understand there better than we than we can do now. And that is, in my view, that's perhaps even more the case with ventilation than uh, than cavitation, mm. uh, uh, but. Sid, uh, you are probably a better person to judge that than I am because you're, you're from the uh, from the Meriton uh, 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 situation rather than uh, than than from the uh, aeronautical uh, community. I think. Right. Well, I I did have um, in school worked with uh, Nick Newman in the propeller tunnel. At, at MIT, and um, that was what they were, you know, largely interested in was the not so much ventilation, but the cavitation, and when, you know, the pressure differential was enough to actually vaporize the water. Um, for people who don't know, you'd be essentially boiling water with a propeller. Yeah. Um, but this can this can happen also on um, these foiling sailboats that they can create both ventilation and cavitation. It's a, it's a distinction might be worth mentioning here because they're, the terms are misused a lot that uh, the, the term cavitation occurs when the water pressure is so low that it's, it's below the vapor pressure of the water and essentially boils the water, whereas ventilation is just a matter of an air bubble getting sucked down onto a, a foil, which could be a propeller or it could be a foil on a you know, high-speed catamaran. Uh, yeah, sure. And so they're they're, but they're they're often you know uh, misused those terms. Um, you mentioned something that I thought was super interesting, which was about the turbulent flow. And I really have no idea personally what's going on in this area, but what comes to mind is that this might be something that, well, it's very chaotic. It's very random. Is it? How is that? How is that being dealt with? Is it being dealt with, you know, statistically or through chaos theory, or what? What are they? How are they approaching this problem? Well, it's, it's not particularly my uh, my 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 subject in uh, in any in any great detail, but I know that lots of people are in in the in the computational fluid dynamic uh, world are trying to improve all sorts of turbulence models that they are using in the uh, in their uh, CFD uh, uh, programs for um, based on the Navier-Stokes uh, equations with the turbulence uh, models uh, added. But I, I don't know really in what area particularly, in what direction they, they are pursuing that, uh, that right now. I'm, I've not been following that in the in the, in, the, in the past uh, ten years or so in any uh, great detail. So uh, 
I, I don't think I can say more about it at this point in time. Okay, well, it's always, you know, it's great to hear these ideas because they're areas where, where we don't have good understanding. And, you know, from our perspective as the Sailing Science Center, we're looking at areas where we, you know, where there is curiosity and curiosity is usually occurs where we don't have a good understanding. Um, and that would be one that would, you know, could be something interesting to look at um, in, a, in a model or an exhibit. Now, speaking of models, um, if you go back, you know, 40 years, we were using model tests to validate designs of yachts and planes and things like that. And in fact, you were uh, working, I think you said at NASA Ames, where, you know, it's the largest wind tunnel in the world. And of course that's um, generally scale models. And with the advent of now very powerful uh, computing, I think that most fluid dynamics is being done on computers. Do you feel that there's still a value and need for, for models and model testing or what, what value would you see in, in still having models? Uh, the uh, drawback, the risk of computer simulation is of course that it's never the, the, the real truth. I mean, it, 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 they are based on models and particularly because of, of turbulence, uh, you're never sure that you model it uh, correctly. To, uh, so it remains important to do uh, testing in, uh, in wind tunnels and then uh, and in towing tanks uh, to validate the results of uh, uh, computational fluid dynamic uh, simulations and designs based on computational fluid dynamic simulation. It, the, the role of uh, physical experiments in, uh, in, in design and development has, has changed, of course, in the, in, in the past uh, few uh, decades in the sense that uh, there's more computational fluid dynamics simulation and, 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 and optimization of, of configurations using CFD. But the eventual, before a, a design is really arrested as, as being the final uh, 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 shape, there's still uh, there's still a role for the uh, physical experiments to validate and check these uh, these results, and that I think will still remain to be the case for some time to come. Perhaps that the uh, the percentage of uh, of effort. Uh, for the on the experimental side and the computational fluid dynamic side, that that will st still move a little bit more to the computational fluid dynamic side, but I I I, I don't see it. I don't see the experiments, the physical experiments, dis disappear uh, completely. I uh, not not within my lifetime, which is <laughs> nearing the end. <laughs> Uh, of course, uh, because I'm getting fairly old, so it's um, it's not a big risk to say that. I think. <laughs> <laughs> well, we hope that you're around for a lot longer, uh, Yoke. The um, this book that you've written is really something, and for anybody who is interested in a fairly technical, you, you've got to be willing to see a few Greek letters and read a few equations here, but a fairly technical book on the science behind sailing. That's the, the title and it's by Yop Sloaf. I think I said that right. 
And yeah, 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 you, you pronounce it right. It's 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 Yoke Slope. It's uh, and uh, Yoke, maybe tell us uh, where is this available? I guess it's on, it's available on Amazon and and anywhere that books are sold. Is it also available in a electronic or Kindle form? Yeah, the, the, it's also available as as an ebook. But it's not it's not a really good ebook. I didn't put any effort in making all the uh, digital. Uh, connections and, and, and jumping from one page to another, I, I, I still have to do that. Uh, so it's it just, uh, at the moment, it's still a simple uh, PDF file that you can uh, download, so to speak, of, of the print book. Okay, well, it's a, it's a spectacular book and it's, it's thoroughly indexed and uh, complete with a large section of references and lots and lots and lots of diagrams and figures. So this is obviously a, a huge um, contribution to the science behind sailing. And it's something that I think we will be turning to with the, with the Sailing Science Center. So what's what's next for Yope Slope? What uh, what are your plans going forward? Are you just enjoying your retirement, or do you have your your hands in in things that uh, keep you keep you excited? Well, I'm 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 still fairly busy. I think I, uh, I, I I'm working also on a book on, on a totally different area. That is the uh, the genealogy of my wife's ancestors. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I found out that uh, she has uh, some kind of, uh, of, of, a, of, of a knight in the Middle Ages <laughs> as one of her ancestors. And it is extremely interesting to see to whom she has been, she, she is, is related through that. Uh, through that line, and uh, I'm trying to to find that out and and, and, and write a book about it. Uh, so it's uh, something completely different. That Apart is, from that, I, I'm I'm still I'm still been sailing this past uh, summer. I still hope to do it next year, but that's the last year, I think. And now, I'll hand, then I'll hand the boat the boat over to my children, and. Uh, I, uh, I'm still uh, physically fairly good. I'm playing tennis twice a week. I play golf uh, once a week and uh, do a lot of walking. I, I try to, uh, to keep doing that for a while. Well, that's terrific. We hope that you stay in good health for a long time and hope that this is not the uh, last conversation between you and the Sailing Science Center. We may have, we may have some questions for you as we develop our exhibits and, um, you know, try to explain some of the things that we don't understand and are and are curious about. Um, you can so, always approach me with questions if you if if you if you would like to do so. No problem. I'll be happy to try to answer that. We've been speaking with Joop Sloof from uh, the Netherlands. And Joop is the author of a book titled The Science Behind Sailing. Uh, Joop, we really want to thank you for your time today. The Sailing Science Center podcast is a production of the San Francisco Sailing Science Center. The interview was conducted by Jim Hancock. Production and editing was performed by Charlie Dice. Thank you for listening.